Hi, I'm Rahul Lyer from Cluster 4, Cosmos UC Davis 2012, and I did a presentation about the possibility of a benign worm. So let's first start off with what worms are. Worms are basically viruses that have the ability to replicate without any user input, such as a user executing a file or running a program. Uh, when most people think of worms, they think of one of the most recent worms, Stuxnet. This caused massive damage in an Iranian nuclear facility because it uh, caused the centrifuges to spin more quickly than they were designed to and caused a massive explosion. So malware is getting more sophisticated these days and there's a possibility to use this malware for good purposes. In fact, uh, many people have already thought of the idea of having a benign worm. It's been proposed for mobile networks to correct viruses on mobile phones. Theoretically, the worm would spread through the nodes that are best connected, such as the ones near the most activity. After spreading through those nodes, users would then transfer the worms onto other nodes, causing it to spread more quickly than it would if it just took all of the routes. If such a worm could be created, then this would be a remarkable step forward for cybersecurity. So, as I mentioned before, the worm has garnered a reputation for being a fearsome vehicle of destruction. An example is the I Love You worm, which caused $875 billion in damage. Um, and in fact billion? 8.75 billion. Yeah, but dollars in damage and delays. Other worms focus more on speed, such as the Slammer worm, which infected more than 90% of all possible users within 10 minutes. The first worm originated on the evening of, of November 22, uh, 2nd, 1988. This worm did not contain any malicious code. In fact, it was an accident. However, it loaded computers up with processes, causing them to slow down and it essentially caused denial of service. The one factor that distinguished this worm from other malware was that it spread without the users having to execute any programs. And I told you about Stuxnet before. Uh, there's another notable worm that's, that has been seen recently called Flame. This one tracked what users were doing, kind of like a keystroke logger. Uh, so malware is getting more sophisticated, but a worm can be used for good. An example would be a worm that goes around and patches vulnerabilities that have just been discovered. That would be one kind of worm. Another possible worm would be one that looks for virus signatures and then deletes the viruses that it founds. So one of the key features that allows for the success of the worm is the random scanning process to find users, infect the users, and then use them as a stepping stone to find more users. Uh, worms use a, very, a variety of media to propagate, such as email, internet relay chat, internet messaging software, peer-to-peer, -to -peer, network drive, and existing backdoors. So they discover different hosts to, through two different approaches. One is the client-oriented approach, where they uh, actively seek targets by harvesting emails and network scanning for open ports. The other approach, the server-oriented approach, where worms infect one server and then continue on to other servers. Uh, however, the server-oriented approach is more of a waiting approach where they wait for the users to come to them. So it doesn't spread quite as fast as it would. Uh, worms scan various ports of systems through many different uh, methods. Two of them are random scanning and local scanning. So local scanning is basically scanning all the ports of the systems on a server. And random scanning is just randomly scanning IP addresses. However, there are other ways of scanning, such as um, permutation scanning and topological scanning. Um, permutation scanning is when an index is encrypted with a cipher and then decrypted, which allows a random IP address to be generated. In topological scanning, the worm scans for worm uh, scans for URLs from a local source and checks against them. So generally, worms use a combination of these types, sometimes having one third of their processes of one type and two thirds of another type. So worms leave a life, a life cycle of four stages. Uh, the first stage is activation when they start spreading. Uh, they then have an option to go into hibernation within which they're dormant and do not perform any activity. However, then they can go through a reactivation phase. Uh, the final phase is death where it self-destructs. So one issue with worms, the lack of control involved. Once it's released, you basically don't have anything that you can do. It just continuously spreads. Even if it's a good, uh, even if it's a well-intentioned worm, it might still cause denial of service attacks. Uh, the worm's quite volatile when it's released. Um, 
Anyway, if a benign worm is modified on the way to users, then many systems could also be compromised. Um, an issue would be uh, the amount of trust given to a benign worm, because if uh, your system treats it like normal malware, then it wouldn't be able to spread quite as well. Uh, if it's trusted absolutely, however, it could be modified and exploited, then causing uh, essentially a game over scenario where it's infecting many computers all over the internet. So I talked about the two options of a worm. One would be patching vulnerabilities as soon as they come out. And another would be actively seeking out viruses. There are actually examples of patchy worms that have actually been found. One of them is Welchia. It was a worm that found a vulnerability and then exploited it. After doing that, it closed the vulnerability so no other viruses could exploit it as well, giving it complete control over the system itself. So, and the other option would be an offensive worm, which would scan for virus signatures on files and then delete the corrupted files. Um, However, this wouldn't be very useful against zero-day exploits due to the signatures not being known, and polymorphic viruses, which also have the ability to change their signatures. So there's one, there are two ways to do it. One would be to implement uh, code uh, similar to that of a retrovirus. A uh, retrovirus is a virus that attacks and disables antivirus systems or even other viruses themselves. An example of that is a uh, retrovirus called uh, W32.dengu. This virus targeted the checksum files and antivirus programs to avoid detection. Um, when combining a benign retrovirus with a worm, one would be able to send out, uh, send out patches for viruses extremely effectively. Uh, however, I personally think the best solution would be to create both of the worms, a patching worm and a signature finding worm for different situations. Uh, the patching worm would be best applied against zero day exploits and the other worm would be best applied when there are systems that have already been infected by other viruses. However, there are many technical issues with, uh, with a worm that um, are associated with it. One is that viruses do not spread in a controlled way. Another is they could find themselves in an unexpected environment where they could do inadvertent damage. And they also waste computer resources, possibly causing denial of service attacks. And the same task could be performed without self-replication. So the potential for this worm is quite doubtable, uh, debatable as well. <laughs> maybe, <yeah. laughs> uh, maybe sometime in the future when the worm won't cause so much damage. But currently, there are a few technical issues stopping the viability of this worm. So there, there's a little bit of potential for this kind of strategy to be applied. However, the inherent nature of a worm, the fact that antivirus systems would possibly target such a worm, and the invasion of the privacy of other people should also be considered. The social aspect is necessary because privacy in the internet is a gray area in which caution must be taken in order to remain on the legal side of things. Uh, uh, worms could also possibly create new problems. However, a worm's speed could give it the advantage over patches from antivirus systems. Precautions must be taken to ensure that a well-meaning worm does not turn into a virus that can be used maliciously. Thank you. Any questions? Have there been any like very recent uh, white worm examples? Um, not really. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned sort of scanning worms, so it's good. You gave a, a nice survey of different ways it can scan. So uh, I, I, can you, any ideas how you might detect uh, a scanning activity? Uh, if something was um, scanning your device or yeah. system? Yeah, how many did you detect that? Uh, you can look for unusual network activity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's about all that I thought. Yeah, okay. That's good. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you.